been asked to deliver things for our organizations with challenging and sometimes competing constraints of budget, deadlines, continuity, and security. And Azure can often help us deliver these solutions in a way that fits into those constraints. And so this is a great kind of a list that I just quickly put together of the things that I think Azure enables us to do in our jobs for our organizations um, that's challenging to do outside of the cloud. So reducing the capital expense and the ongoing cost of the infrastructure. Improving business continuity. And I'm going to show you some ways that we can do that in Azure. Innovating rapidly. Oftentimes, we're asked to do things with very short notice, and we may require some hardware acquisition to do that, and, and sometimes we just can't meet those needs quickly. Azure can help us do that. And ultimately, what that all does is it gives us an increased focus on our core business instead of racking and stacking servers in our data center and configuring hypervisors and all of that. We end up with better stability, reliability, supportability, and ultimately security as well. Now, one of the ways this is all achieved is through the regions and the data centers that Azure has around the world. So this is a, a slide that I love. It is the Azure regions that are available around the world today. So there's 42 you'll see on this, on this map. Um, there's actually 36 that are available today. So all of those orange dots those regions are all available today and you can deploy into those. Those blue dots are regions that have been announced that are coming in the next several months. There's two in France, two new ones in Australia. Um, but actually the ones um, on the, in, in Asia are already there, but there's two more um, in Africa as well that have been announced. So Azure is the first cloud provider to have announced regions in Africa. Now, all this is important because one of the challenges we have in our traditional data centers is we often can't deploy our applications close to our users uh, in the global scenarios because provisioning another data center around the world is expensive. Uh, and even for something like disaster recovery, it's expensive to have a warm site somewhere else. But Azure gives us the luxury to do that, to deploy infrastructure close to our users, reducing the network latency for them to get to our infrastructure and our services. Now, to begin delivering these kinds of solutions, we need a place to host our applications and our systems. And Azure provides several ways to do that. But we're going to talk about infrastructure services today. And at the core, we have compute services in Azure that allow us to deploy our applications. And we have compute services much like we would have in our own data centers, virtual machines. So servers that are ours that we can manage from the OS up. It's all ours, our responsibility to patch and all that good stuff. We also have a service in Azure called VM Scale Sets. And that is extremely useful. It's, it's much like virtual machines. But in a scenario where you have a server, like a web server, that you want to stamp out over and over and over again, and you want to be able to auto scale those, VM scale sets give you that capability. I can template that VM and I can auto scale that and scale it up massively. Uh, so that's what VM scale sets is all about. <clears throat> and right in the middle of those is availability sets. And that's a way for us to group our servers together, our virtual machines together in a way that Microsoft knows how to split them up across points of failure. For example, think about a rack of servers having a single point of failure in a data center, a top of the rack switch, a power unit, something like that. If we had multiple VMs in a web farm, multiple web servers, we would want to split that up across multiple racks so that if one of those died, our other two would be running, for example, in another rack. And availability sets give us a way to do that. So we don't have to think about how that works in the data center. We just put those into an availability set, and Microsoft will ensure that those are scaled out across multiple points of failure. Now, after we get our, our applications hosted and running in Azure, we need a place to store data. And Azure provides a number of places that we can store data. For example, our VMs that we have running have to have disks attached to them. We have to have a disk that has the OS. We have to have disks maybe that have additional storage that we're using for data disks. 
And so Azure has a storage service where we can store those disks. Uh, in, in a storage service, an object store called blob storage. Those disks are VHD files, uh, and we can store those in blob storage. Now, there's a couple of types of uh, storage that we have to choose from here. We have standard storage, which gives us one level of performance. And then we have premium storage, which is running on super fast SSDs, giving us great performance, low latency, um, and a great number of IOPS because of those SSDs. In addition to just using blob storage for those disks, there's also a relatively new service called managed disks. And this takes it a step further where we no longer have to think about the storage accounts and the blob storage and the VHDs. We just tell Azure we need a disk and we want to attach it to this VM. And Azure goes off and manages that for us. So we don't have to worry about throughput limits and, and targets for a storage account, for example, when we're architecting our solution. Now, blob storage we could also use for other objects. So if we had other binary data that we wanted to store, we can use blob storage to do that as well. And then last, if we need a file server, there is a service in Azure called Azure Files. If we didn't want to deploy our own file server, our own network attached storage kind of appliance or a DFS um, file server in Azure, we can use Azure Files to do that. Um, but if we wanted to, we could always fall back and deploy our own infrastructure as well in our own file servers too. And lastly, at the core, we need to be able to securely communicate with all of these systems. And there are several networking services in Azure that enable us to do that. First off, we're going to put those VMs, those virtual machines, inside of a virtual network that we define. We get to own the address space. We get to define that address space. We get to define the subnetting. We get to configure how DNS is going to work and how that how the IP addresses are going to get DHCP'd to all of those servers. So that's all ours. We get to do all of that. Now, we may want to bridge this, and we may want to use Azure as sort of a an extension of our own on-premises data center. And that's where services like VPNs come into play or taking it down even at a lower level to an MPLS network express route. And so you can bridge and extend your data center into Azure and extend Azure into your data center. And then we probably want to load balance some things like some virtual machines, like web servers. And so we have load balancers and we have some edge services like uh, CDNs and DNS and traffic manager to help route traffic across multiple regions, for example. So that's the services that are at the core. Now with that, I want to share my screen and just start creating some resources in Azure. Now I'm going to show you the Azure portal first. And this is really the easiest way to get started deploying services in Azure. Um, can everybody, can, we, can you guys see my screen? I want to make sure uh, what I'm seeing in my live preview doesn't look like you're seeing my screen. So, okay. Um, let me see how to let me try this again here. All right. I think it's loading up now. Um, perfect. So this is the Azure portal. If you're not familiar with Azure at all, uh, this is the place, uh, the, the kind of single pane of glass where we manage all of our Azure services. Now, I want to go through the process of creating a new virtual machine, some new infrastructure services. So over in the left-hand corner, you'll notice there's a new button up here. I'm going to click that new button, and this is going to take me to kind of a category browser where I can start creating some resources here in Azure. And you'll notice at the very top are these infrastructure services that I just talked about. So compute, networking, storage. I'm going to first go into compute. And you'll notice that there's some featured items, some recommendations. Um, so you'll see here I have Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition. I could create a VM right here um, that is Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition. You'll notice right below that, I have a couple of Linux SKUs as well. So I have Red Hat. Um, I have Ubuntu. So I could deploy a couple of Linux distros right here in Azure as well. So one thing to keep in mind is Azure is not the, it is the Microsoft Cloud, but it is not exclusive to Microsoft uh, sort of products and offerings. In fact, this marketplace um, that you see right here at the top has tons, like 3,500 items from vendors 
from from Microsoft as well as third party vendors as well, including open source vendors like Red Hat and Ubuntu. So with that, I'm going to create a Windows Server VM right here. So I'm going to click on this Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition and start walking through the process. It's really quite simple. It starts asking me for some basic information to start with. It's going to ask me for the name that I want to use for this server. And I'm going to just use today's date just for simplicity. So I'm going to say 2017-1108-WS for Windows Server. We talked about disks already, and so it's going to ask us what kind of disks do we want. Do we want those fast SSDs, or do we want to see, uh, we want to reduce our cost with some uh, spinning disks, some, some HDDs. We're going to leave it with SSDs. It's going to give us some higher performance, and I would generally recommend using that if you're, uh, if you're deploying a production environment. I'm going to enter in a username here and a password. And this is going to be my local admin account for this server. Next, it's going to ask me for a resource group. And this is just a way that I can group things together. Uh, and I'm going to show you how this comes into play in a little bit uh, in terms of managing these services. So I'm going to create a resource group. I'm just going to name it exactly the same as our VM in this case. And then we have this drop down of all of these regions around the world. So that map that I showed you, I'm going to just imagine that my users in this scenario are going to be on the east coast of the US, and I'm going to select that option. One of the things that's important here is it relates to infrastructure. You'll see this option here to save money. If you already have Windows Server licenses, then you can bring your own kind of Windows Server license and save 40%. So if you're already running Windows Server in your data center and you have these licenses, you can kind of dual to use them, use them again here in Azure, and, uh, and save some money. So it's something that you should look into uh, as you're doing this. Next, we get to choose the size of the VM. And we get some recommendations right here from the start. But I'm going to go bounce over to a list of VM sizes in in Azure in the documentation on Microsoft.com because this is uh, this is kind of important here. So there are that list is massive. So I want to start by saying that there are tons of VM sizes and they're designed for different styles of workloads. So you'll see we are going to provision a DSV2 VM um, and that's in that general purpose category. But if we had uh, heavy compute workloads that we need more CPU to memory, then we have those compute optimized sizes. If we need just the opposite, we need more memory than CPU, there are those memory op optimized sizes. Uh, and we can keep going on and, and, and see that we have GPU uh, optimized resources as well. So if we wanted some NVIDIA GPUs for some machine learning sort of computations that we may be doing, um, then we can configure those as well. And there are then also these uh, HPC sizes as well that have better network uh, throughput with RDMA. So there's a lot of options. There's generally a size for every workload you're trying to provision, and there are some massive sizes in here as well. Uh, and you can see all of those in the portal by clicking this View All link uh, here when you're on that size, um, size screen here. But I'm going to choose DS1 V2, press Select, and continue on. Now this next pane is a number of kind of advanced settings. So I've talked about this already, availability sets. If we were creating uh, a web farm, for example, where we're going to have multiple load balanced servers, then we want to do, we want to create this availability set so that we can ensure this is going to be split out across multiple single points of failure. So I'm going to go ahead and just name this IIS. This is going to be my IIS web server, if you will. And you'll see that it's going to be split out across a couple of fault domains. And then we have this option of update domains. And this is all around uh, planned maintenance. So as Microsoft does maintenance to uh, like the host uh, OSs, um, the, the hypervisors, then they will take into consideration these update domains so they don't take down everything all at once. So this is really important as it relates to uptime and reliability. Now the next option on this screen is around storage in those disks. So I mentioned earlier we could create our own disks inside of a storage account. If we select no here, on storage, it's going to ask us what storage account we want to use for those. So we manage it ourselves. We have to worry about architecting for the performance targets and throughput targets for a storage account in Azure. But if we don't want to worry about that, then we can just 
choose yes here. This is relatively new, but this will allow Microsoft to manage all of this for us. We no longer have to manage uh, that piece of it. And then next, I get to configure the virtual network. So I get to do it all in this nice wizard here. So you'll see we get to name this, and it's already named it for us. I get to define the address space. And generally, I'm going to define something pretty big here. Um, but you want to make sure it doesn't collide uh, with your network. And I already have one defined with that in my subscription, so it's not going to let me do that. But uh, you want to make sure it's not going to collide with your network. Uh, so that you can create VPN tunnels and express routes that will route that traffic appropriately between the two if you need to. Then you get to define the subnet. So we might say, might call this DMZ, for example, and that's our first subnet in our virtual network. So I'm going to press OK here, and we have all of that configured. We get to define whether we want a public IP address. In this case, I want a public IP on this server. We also get to define network security groups here, and this is basically a list of IPsec firewall rules. Now, the network security group in this case is going to be tied uh, to this VM, but we can also tie it to a subnet. And I'm going to show you all of that as well. Uh, but here we're saying on the inbound traffic, we want to allow RDP. Because I want to be able to remote desktop into this VM after I create it. So you'll see that I have 3389 allowed. Um, so that I can come in and manage this VM later. So it's got a public IP address, and I'm allowing that in the firewall rules. There's some other options that I can configure here, like some monitoring, boot diagnostics. Um, I can configure auto shutdown if I want this VM to shut down at certain points of time during the day. Um, but I think I'm good here. I'm going to click OK. And then the last screen that I have is a quick validation. So it checks all of the settings that I've they've configured here, and it does a validation to make sure it all is going to work well together. And it shows me a, a at-a-glance view at the top here of the price for this VM. So I'm going to pay 7.3 cents per hour. And that's important because Azure gives us the ability to just pay for the time that we use these services. So it's not that I'm going to pay uh, $55 a month for this VM. I'm actually going to pay for the minutes that I use this VM, so while it's provisioned, that's when I pay for it. I'm going to press Create here and start that process. But that gives us a lot of flexibility as it relates to scale, and it makes the whole cost model uh, work. All right, so that VM is creating. I have, like any great cooking show, set up some VMs ahead of this uh, webinar, because this is going to take a couple of minutes. You guys are all uh, IT professionals, and you understand what creating a server is like, I'm expecting. So you understand this is going to take a few minutes to deploy a VM, uh, regardless of where that data center is. So we're going to let that do its thing. Uh, and I'm going to go click into some existing VMs that we have. So right here on my desktop, I have a VM that was pinned called Webinar WS 2016-01. And this is a Windows Server VM. And you can tell that, because right here under Operating System, it says it's Windows. We get a quick overview of where this VM is provisioned, where it's deployed into, uh, the status of that VM, and some other information like the subscription that it's in and, and what have you. You'll notice down below, we get some nice charts that give us a quick at-a-glance view of things like CPU utilization, network I.O., and all of that. Um, You'll also see at the very top there's a connect button. That's really important because that gives us the ability to download an RDP file so we can remote desktop into this VM, just like we would any other kind of VM in our data center or somewhere else. We also see some controls up here at the top to start and stop that VM and restart it. We have a button to capture. That capture button allows us to take an image of this VM so we can redeploy VMs that look just like this one. So after we get it all configured, uh, we can capture and, and sysprep and create an image of this VM and then redeploy that over and over again. I mentioned earlier disks. So under settings on the left-hand side, you'll see that we can come in here and add a data disk. We already have our OS disk that's attached in a standard storage account, um, but we can add a data disk. And we can name the data disk, create a data disk right here, walk through the process, configure the size, uh, and deploy this right into um, our, our server. I'm not going to do that, but we can. one of the things that's important to understand is the, the number of data disks that can be deployed. Uh, and so it's generally a ratio of 
two disks per CPU core. And as you're browsing the VM sizes on Azure.com, you'll see that noted. Um, now, after I've created the VM, I'm not stuck with the size that I selected. So I can select size here and scale this up or down at any point in time as well. Um, so that's important to note uh, as well. And then you'll see the availability set. If I've configured an availability set, you'll see that here as well. And you'll see the fault and update domains that were configured with that. All right. One other thing I want to show you is this Ubuntu server that's sitting here on my desktop. Now you'll notice that this looks exactly the same as that Windows server here in the Azure portal, except for the operating system clearly tells us that we are looking at a Linux server, not a Windows server. And if I go click that connect button at the top, we get an SSH command that we can use to remote into and manage this VM. If I go open up my kind of favorite remote management tool, which is called in Remote NG, if you're not familiar with this, highly recommend it. Uh, I can paste in that IP address into my uh, remote management tool. It's a free tool, uh, in remote ng .org. Um But it's a nice tab interface where you'll see that I can just double click that VM and I am in to that Ubuntu VM via SSH. And so I can do you know, whatever I would do, uh, whatever I need to do to manage this VM, if I wanted to see a list of running processes, for example, I could just run top here and see that list of running top uh, running processes. So, so this VM is just like any other Ubuntu server running in my data center or any other. I would manage it in exactly the same way. Um, so that's, that's pretty important to, to note as well. All right. With that, I'm going to come back to the Azure portal in just a minute, but I want to talk about why you would do this. And it's very common for our customers to run traditional line of business applications in Azure infrastructure services. Now, there are other services in Azure that, that folks like to use. They're platform services to host web apps and services for building mobile backends and that sort of thing. But if you're trying to run legacy or, or applications that require you to have control and access to the OS for configuration, then you're going to fall back to these infrastructure services. It's often that our customers use Azure infrastructure services for dev test. And one of the things that's important to note there is a lot of infrastructure that is in our data centers today are used for dev test, but it's not that we need that infrastructure all the time. The dev team, the, the QA team needs that for generally a period of time. And so if we could repurpose that infrastructure and deploy that out to the cloud, and let developers start and stop that when they need it and pay for what they use, then we could reclaim a lot of that infrastructure we have uh, in our data centers to use for production scenarios. And Azure gives us the ability to do fast and simplified provisioning, and I'm going to show you some of that as it relates to DevOps as well. The other thing that we get is the ability to really try to create something that is very similar to our production environments in terms of scale. One of the things that's challenging to do in our data centers is to get enough infrastructure, enough servers, um, and enough resources for our dev teams uh, to really build and simulate real production scenarios. And then ultimately, we get to minimize that waste and cost by being able to, uh, to use it as we need it and, and that pay-as-you-go model. All right, so I want to talk about some additional capabilities in Azure. I mentioned DevOps a second ago, and I am a huge fan of automation and DevOps. And Azure has DevOps built in at the core. In Azure, we, we talked about resource groups briefly and how we can group multiple resources together. In addition to being able to do that with resource groups, that is built on a management plane called Azure Resource Manager. And that gives us the ability to manage resources as a group of resources, but it also gives us the ability to do things like define those resources with a template uh, 
so that we can then deploy all of them at once. So you'll see a diagram on my screen right now that shows a database and a web app and some virtual machines. We can use resource groups to group those things together, manage them together as a unit, and deploy them together as well. So I want to show you that capability. So I'm going to go back to my screen share here. And I'm going to load up GitHub. So I know some of you may be familiar with this. Some may not. Some may, some may not be developers on this call, and that's OK. Uh, GitHub has a repository out here with a, just a massive number of templates that we can use to deploy resources to Azure. Now I'm going to just show you that quickly and load up the Azure Quick Starts repository on GitHub. If I scroll down, you will see that all of these directories here, these are templates uh, for very specific workloads that we can deploy into Azure. And so one of these templates in this list is a template that lets us deploy two virtual machines serving as a web farm, two IIS virtual machines, and one SQL Server virtual machine. So I scroll down, you'll see this is the, the basic architecture diagram for this deployment. There's a load balancer that load balances across multiple web servers that are part of an availability set. They are in a subnet. Then there is a back-end subnet, a database subnet, that has a SQL server in it. There's network interfaces attached, uh, and it's inside of this virtual network, and it talks to Azure Storage uh, for its disks. If I go up to the top in this GitHub repository and look at this template, you'll see a button that says Deploy to Azure. If I just click that button, this will take me into the Azure portal, and it will load that template up for me, and it will ask me to configure some parameters for that template. So you'll see here, it's asking me for a few parameters that are required for this template. So what do I want to prefix this um, environment as? Uh, it's going to use that for the naming throughout. It asks me for a user and a password. It asks me for some sizes of the VMs. So uh, there's the sizes that are allowed in this template and uh, the number of web servers, for example. So I could select one or two, on and on. When I get done with configuring this, I can just say purchase right here and it will deploy this into my subscription. Now, this will in fact take a little while, uh, much longer than our other VM because it's a whole group of services, but I did this right before the webinar uh, a couple hours ago. And so I'm going to load that up. So I've got a resource group called IaaS Webinar. And you'll see here the list of resources that got deployed as a result of that template. So all of this was automated, and if I go load that template up inside of Visual Studio Code, and if you're not familiar with Visual Studio Code, it's just a really nice text editor with some syntax highlighting, um, and it's all free, so you can just download it uh, from Microsoft. But you'll see this is the template that deployed all of those resources, and it's just simply a JSON file that defines all of those resources and their relationships together. I can customize this template, add additional things to this template, remove things from this template, um, and then redeploy this into Azure. Now, I clicked this nice, friendly button inside of that template in GitHub to deploy this. But I also mentioned earlier that I would show you, show you some PowerShell. So I'm going to load up my PowerShell terminal here. And I'm already logged into my Azure subscription. But the first command that you would run to do that is you would type in login Azure RM account. And then that would prompt you for your username and password for your Azure subscription. I'm already, I've already done that, so I'm in my Azure subscription now. And I can run a commandlet here. I'm going to create a new resource group. So I'm going to type in new Azure RM resource group. And I'm going to name this, and I'm going to call it IaaS Webinar 
V2. And I'm going to put it in the East US region. So I hit enter here. And it has created that new resource group for us. So if I go back to the Azure portal, and I go back to our list of resource groups, we're going to see that RG IaaS Webinar V2 resource group right here. Now, there's no deployments. There's nothing um, in this resource group yet. We just created a brand new from PowerShell. But now I want to do a deployment. So those templates that we were just looking at on our system, I can take those templates and deploy those. So I can say new Azure RM resource group deployment, name this, IIS and SQL. And we're going to use that resource group that we just created. And I am going to copy the path to that file. I'm going to paste it in here. And lastly, I'm going to copy the path to the parameters file. And these are just the parameters that we are using. I'm going to name this I as I as we'll say this I as webinar v2. Um, and you'll see my password's super secure here. Um, so these are the parameters that we're using for this deployment. I'm going to go back to my command prompt, my PowerShell window here, paste that in, and hit enter. And it's going to run this template just like we did from the portal and deploy this into Azure. So you'll see from a DevOps perspective, Azure was built kind of from the core with this automation and DevOps in mind so that we can automate our deployments uh, into Azure uh, from both the both the portal, we can use these templates as well as PowerShell. We could also use the command prompt. If you're not familiar with PowerShell, if you prefer uh, a command line interface, there are Azure, uh, there's an Azure command line interface as well that you can use. But if you're using a Mac or a Linux uh, system as well, those command line interfaces are cross-platform, so you can use them from anywhere, regardless of the platform. If I re refresh this resource group, then you're going to start to see those resources as part of that deployment showing up here. Uh, and we can click into that deployment and see there's our deployment we, we executed from PowerShell, and it's deploying into Azure for us. All right. So at the core, Microsoft has thought of this whole DevOps uh, scenario for us, and we don't have to even uh, even think about building anything to make that all work. We could also use third-party DevOps tools in these VMs. So we often use Chef and Puppet um, inside of our VMs to automate some uh, configuration, some application sort of configuration inside the VMs. And you can do that too. There are extensions inside of Azure to inject Chef and Puppet right into your VMs. Now, one of the questions that often comes up is, okay, this is all great. We have our infrastructure running in Azure, but how do we monitor all of that? So you'll notice on my sidebar at the left, there is an option called Monitor. So I'm going to click into that. Now, the Azure Monitor service is all about monitoring the events and the activities that are happening at the raw sort of Azure resource level. So you'll see I have some activity log errors here. And so I'm going to click into that, and this will show me all of the activities that are happening, and specifically the errors that are happening in my subscription. So you'll see that I logged in. There's my username over here on the right. Um, and it's showing me all the activities that I initiated that have failed. I could also filter this down and see um, just kind of all of these activities, not just the failures um, as well and get a list of all the activities that I have been initiating. I can filter it down by who did it. So I'm trying to do an audit and figure out, hey, who created these servers? I can filter this down as well and say, let me show me everything that Eric did uh, and filter this list down. So this is great for monitoring the activities that have occurred on the Azure services to get an, an audit log of all of those sorts of things.
in addition, I may want to monitor stuff happening within my services. So within my virtual machines, I have applications running, and I want to monitor the events that are that are occurring inside of those servers. And so there is a service called Log Analytics. So I'm going to click into Log Analytics, and it's just like it sounds. It is collecting log and event data from our services throughout Azure, so inside of the VMs in this case, and enabling us to see that data in a centralized single pane of glass. So you'll see here, inside of Log Analytics, I have an option to log search. So if I click log search here, from here we can see some kind of common searches, some recommendations. So for example, if I wanted to see uh, everything with, with Windows in the heartbeat, I can see that. And I can see that as a list, or I can change it and see it in a nice kind of table gridded view. Over here on the left, we'll see some filter options. So if I wanted to just see it for a single VM that I have running, I can apply that filter as well. And I can see uh, all that log data uh, from just that VM. All right. Now, Azure Log Analytics is part of a larger service, and you'll see this throughout the portal. You see OMS portal right here. Log Analytics is part of a suite of services uh, called Operations Management Suite. So if you see OMS throughout the portal uh, or in documentation, that's what it's referring to is the suite of products that are really designed for us as operations folks that are managing systems and infrastructure. In addition to just that log search capability, it all kind of hinges on getting that logging data, but there are kind of management packs that are built on top of this. So think of this almost like a, a system center in the cloud sort of service. If I click into this overview right here, it's going to take me to the Log Analytics like OMS portal. And this is really important for managing our, our environment and our, our services in Azure. And so this is loading up um, some nice visuals for us. And we can see some things that just that OMS just handles for us automatically uh, and shows us automatically. For example, an anti-malware assessment. We can see that we don't have the right level of pr protection on one of our servers. So if we click into that, that will show us those servers loading in here. All right, well, I'm going to bail from that, but that will show us the servers where um, where we, we need to uh, take action uh, for anti-malware. The activity logs that we were looking at inside of Azure Monitor, those logs also come into Log Analytics. And so we can see those right here from the OMS portal as well. Uh, because we do want to get that single, single sort of pane of glass of all of these activities in one spot. So you can see the, the same things we were looking at, who did what, there's my username here. If I click into that, I can see who did what, uh, see all the things that I did uh, inside of this Azure subscription. And again, I can just see it as this nice table view, and we can see all of those activities. So for auditing purposes, this is really important. All right. I want to talk about security. Uh, and you'll see some of this here, and we'll, we'll come back to security here in this portal. Uh, but you may have heard of Azure Security Center. And so I'm going to flip over to Azure Security Center. And this is a service in Azure that is pretty, uh, pretty amazing what, what happens. Uh, so Microsoft Cybersecurity, that team, can take all the data that they have collected across all of their properties and build machine learning models out of that uh, to then help us as Azure users identify potential issues and risks in our uh, environments. So you'll see Azure Security Center has done just that. It has found some issues in our infrastructure. And you'll notice that it's got some recommendations. We see a lot of reds. We have a lot of issues in what we have deployed. But if I click into compute here, it's going to tell us that 
we don't have endpoint protection on four of the seven VMs that we have running. And we have OS vulnerabilities on three of the seven VMs and that sort of thing. So we can just get a quick at a glance view of where we have issues. And then we can go into VMs and computers and we can see all of those. Um, so we can get a nice indicator that these are compliant, these have the right updates, these do not, these have vulnerabilities, and we get recommendations. Uh, so this is extremely valuable for managing security uh, and the health, basically, of the security of our environment in Azure. Um, in addition, we'll get network recommendations as well. So that tells us about kind of the state of the OS, but the state of the network is is here as well. So it's going to tell us, hey, we don't have IPsec uh, network security groups enabled on these subnets, and we probably should. We probably want to restrict access to some of the VMs as well. They're internet facing. Uh, we may have things like RDP exposed, and uh, we want to we want to lock that down as well. So this is amazingly helpful in managing the security uh, in our environments. Now, there is some confusion around, well, what's the difference between monitor, security center, and OMS log analytics? So monitor is just that it's, it's monitoring the activities and the operations that have occurred in our Azure subscriptions. Security center is giving us security insights into the services in our subscription. OMS Log Analytics brings that all together in a single pane of glass, as well as allows us to bring in and ingest our own custom logging to, uh, to OMS as well, that we can then correlate all together in one, one view. So you'll see here we have those same security recommendations right here as well. So I go into security, security and audit. That package, that solution here, is the same things that we saw in Security Center. It's just brought in to OMS here for us. And so we'll see, loading in, um, but we'll see the computers that are missing updates and all of that, and we just get that brought into one nice view where we can manage that. All right, that's one aspect of security. The other is access control. And you may or may not be aware of this, but Azure, is built on top of a service uh, called Azure Active Directory for authentication, for um, authentication and authorization. Now, Azure Active Directory is a big service that does a number of things, but it is what you're logging into to get access to Azure. Now, it's the same service that powers Office 365. So if you have Office 365 deployed, the users that are logging into Office 365 are ultimately logging into Azure Active Directory. The good news is, you already have your users in Azure Active Directory that you can just kind of leverage from Azure. Now you'll notice in my list of users here, I just have two. I have myself, I'm gonna click into this one more time, myself and I created a test user called Chris Green. And Chris has a username and a login here, but he's not an admin. I have given Chris access to one thing, I've given him access to one resource group in our subscription. If I go back over to that resource group, I mentioned earlier that resource groups provide the ability to group resources together for deployment, but also for management and security. So I'm gonna go down into this resource group. Actually, I'm gonna go back into this IaaS webinar resource group. And you'll notice this is the one that has the web servers and the SQL server here. But over here on the left-hand side is an option for access control. If I click into access control, I can add users and give them specific roles into this resource group. So I added Chris Green here by just clicking the add button at the top, selecting one of the users, and selecting a role. And you'll see there's a number of roles. You can create your own as well, um, but there are a number of roles here that I, can, that I can assign and give permission to. Now I gave Chris reader access to this resource group. 
Now, I also opened up a, an in-private browsing session inside of Edge, and I've logged in. You'll see at the very top, I've logged in with Chris. If I go to All Resources, actually, if I go to Resource Groups, rather, you'll see the only thing Chris sees is that IaaS Webinar Resource Group. If I click into that, and I look at one of these virtual machines, for example, then I can see all of that data that I have given Chris access to inside of uh, this resource group. But if I were to try to create something in this resource group, it would fail because I've only given Chris reader access in this resource group, and I haven't given him access to contribute anything. And so that's really important. I can get down to very fine-grained rules uh, and, and grant permissions appropriately throughout my Azure subscription. All right, so we talked about security. We've talked about management. The last thing, the last kind of big item here that I want to talk about is backup and disaster recovery. Over here on the left-hand side, uh, somewhere in my list here, I'm going to actually go back to my other portal. That would be a good start. Let me close this down. Um, in my list here, I should see recovery service vaults. Now, from an Azure virtual machine, I can back it up. Let me go back out, actually, to one of the VMs that I created. And this is one that we just created, so it's, it's fresh and it's not been backed up yet. I can click into that VM, and over on the left-hand side, under Operations, one of the items we see is Backup. If I click into Backup, I can configure an entire virtual machine backup for this VM. I can configure the policy. In this case, the policy, the default policy here is just every day at 5 p.m. I'm going to do a backup, and I'm going to retain that for 30 days. But I could create a grandfather, father, son sort of rotation to keep long-term backups for uh, you know years if I needed to. Um, uh, periodically, like a monthly backup, let's keep that for a year while we have those daily backups. Uh, so I can configure the policy here, but I can enable backup on this, uh, and then I will have backups that I can easily restore from. So if I go back and I look at one of those other VMs that I've already created, we'll see that the backup is already configured, and I will be able to restore well, i tell you that, I'll be able to restore from um, one of those backups that are already sitting there. So let me go grab that. And here we go, inside of Azure Backup. So you can see now, it shows us our last backup time, our last restore point, and we can choose to restore this entire VM or we could just browse inside of that backup to do a file recovery as well. In addition to backup, I may want to have kind of a warm site for disaster recovery. And so Azure has a service called Site Recovery. And Site Recovery allows you to do just that. So I can configure this VM to be ready to fail over. And so you see, you see I already did that for this VM. It's part of that Recovery Services Vault. And it is, this VM is currently in the East US, but I have set this up so that it can fail over to South Central US. And so it is, you'll see my recovery point objective here is one minute. It is, con it is constantly um, replicating the data for this VM to this other site. And I can just click these buttons at the top to fail over, to fail this VM over to this other region. So in the event of a disaster in one region or data center, I can fail this over. Now the interesting thing is both of these services, Azure Backup as well as Site Recovery, they can be used outside of Azure as well. So I can use Azure Backup to back up resources in my own data centers, and I can use Site Recovery to fail over services and servers from my data center into Azure. 
So those are both extremely valuable services, both on-prem as well as Azure. All right. So with that, I'm going to pause right here. We're going to talk about uh, quickly kind of what we've covered, um, and that is the core Azure infrastructure services and what they provide, savings, reliability, innovation. We talked about getting to market quickly. We took a look at compute, storage, and networking, and how we can use those core services to kind of build up web servers and SQL servers and just core infrastructure for line of business apps and dev test scenarios. 